Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Debbie Bergeron, the Deputy Director of Community Engagement and Innovation here at NHSA, and very excited to kick off our Bold Leadership Series here at NHSA. And just to give you a little bit of foundation, we have been working really hard over the past, I'd say 12 weeks here, to try and think about how we can create some new energy for this program year. Uh, to say the last two years have been difficult would be a huge understatement. Um, and things feel unpredictable. I don't think we can change that. But what we do think um, is really important for Head Start and Early Head Start is for us to sort of get out of that space, start to think a little bit differently and re-energize ourselves for a really promising program year. And part of that, um, a big part of that is driven by leadership. Um, I, I'm not really sure programs or staff are going to see. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Betsy. I'm not loving the hair. I got to be honest. I'm just like these roots. I don't know. I haven't cut my hair since COVID. This is a weird thing. Anyway, thanks, Betsy. Um, uh, you know, your staff aren't going to come back energized if leadership isn't energized. They're going to follow your lead in terms of what it means to work at your program. So the next a few weeks, we are gonna offer a bold leadership series with a different speaker every other week. Each topic is really, we tried to get right on the edges of things. We're not talking about the mainstream leadership stuff. Um, and so we hope you'll really enjoy this and it will give you new ideas and um, some new energy for a new program year. That's what we're hoping. I have my yellow on for energy today. We're all ready to go. And I could not be more excited about our first speaker. So Carrie Allred is, I, I, I could tell you about her from a bio standpoint, that she's the executive director of Rural Utah Child Development. She's been there for nine years. She's got her bachelor's in child development and her master's in human and family development. And she's got a 30 year career. She, she is not lacking experience. I could go through that stuff, but I wanna tell you something different because what really made me reach out to Carrie is her unique perspective of the world. She sees herself and her staff and her place on this planet in a way that brings energy to leadership that we all should embrace. And so I'm hoping that what I'm able to do today is to bring you somebody who can really give you just this new way of thinking about your job if you uh, were in Baltimore at our national conference, you may have caught her breakout session. I was sitting on the floor in the back because there was no room to sit. And um, I believe it's one of the only sessions I've actually laughed out loud at a, at a <laughs> conference in a legitimate way. We had a blast. It was funny. It was poignant. Um, the entire room was focused. So I reached out to her and said, we're doing this series. Would you spend an hour with us without even hesitation? She said, yes, but I wanna front load this because this will be a challenging session to do virtually. Um, Carrie's gift is something you can feel when you're in a room with her. It's gonna be harder to get to that today. I know she's gonna do her best. We can help her. The first thing we can do is turn our cameras on. She needs to see that there are people out there. That's how she's gonna connect with you. Um, and this is interactive uh, and it's not your typical interactive. So we're gonna ask for a lot of like chat responses and, and for you to really be thinking and maybe jot some things down in front of you as if you are sitting, I want you just to imagine you're not all separated out throughout the country that you're actually here together in a single room. And I think she can create that vibe. And I'm, I hope you really enjoy this and I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. And thanks for being here. Thank you, Dr. B, and uh, thank you to everybody. I have as many little squares on my screen. This is like a bit of a fever dream because I'm sitting in an office alone. I have signs on the door that says recording in progress, but if somebody walks in, we're going to roll with it. We're going to roll with it. So we're going to be friends by the end of the hour. So I'm going to ask you to do a thing that friends do at the beginning. And then at the end, you're going to be like, yeah, because we're friends. About 14 years ago, when my oldest daughter was in junior high, we were at a, uh, an arts festival in the small town that we live in, and we ran into her math teacher, who was 
so cute. So cute. His name is Mr. Z. And I talked to him and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm being so charming. And I'm like one of those moms that's going to be like, Jessica's going to be so proud of me. And she's like, oh, the, the, he, he just loved you so much. And as he walked away, I turned to her with so much pride. And she turned back to me and said, you had lipstick on your teeth the whole time you were talking to him. So today I'm wearing red lipstick. And I have, a, I have 135 friends on here. And if I have lipstick on my teeth and somebody doesn't tell me, we're done. So raise a hand. Who's going to tell me if I get lipstick on my teeth in this recording? I got some friends out there. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That's the most important ground rule. Uh, we, we have some time to talk. I have so many things to say, and I appreciate the conversations that, that Dr. B and I have had about this uh, topic of burnout. I have a lot of personal experience with this. You're going to hear a few stories. But there's a few things that I want to talk about as we go into this webinar. In order to talk about this topic, we have to do things radically different. So I'm going to ask you to do something radically different. I'm going to ask you to, for the next 55 minutes, to not multitask. I know you're going to want to check that email. I know you're going to want to look at your phone. I know somebody's going to walk in and you're going to want to give them the answer that you think only you have. I hope by the end of this, you'll do things differently, but I'm going to ask for the next hour. Would you gift yourself an hour of unavailability? One of the most pervasive stressors in our world today is the idea that if somebody sees your car in the parking lot, you are available to them. And that if your door is closed, there is a sense of, I'm going to knock on it and come in anyways. So we're going to talk about that. And so a good practice would be, let's start right now. I want you to remember who you were before you were a wife, a husband, a mom, a dad, a boss, an employee. I want you to remember who you were before you went into high school. Just think for one second. Before you work, went into high school, you had dreams, you had thoughts, you had beliefs, you had magic. Let's talk from that place today. Not as the roles that you are right now, but that magic person that you are underneath all of those roles that you play. So I'd love it if you would get something to write on and something to write with and to jot notes. In, the, in the, the chat, there is a link to a blog that I started um, last, uh, the first time I did this session was in Florida at the parent conference. And I started a blog before then because I didn't wanna do slides. So I'm not gonna do slides this time either because I want to just talk. I want us to talk and connect. The notes are on the blog. You can access them later or you can take a few notes if you would like. Thank you for dropping that link in the chat. I appreciate it. But I want you to focus on what I say today and only focus on what resonates with you. So I'm going to say a whole lot of things, and some of those things are going to be for you, and some of those things are not going to be for you. And I hope that you just write down the things that resonate with you. So we're going to, we're going to start with a story. And it's a story of, of a day in my life as an executive director. So you're, most of you are Head Start people. And uh, most of you know what the world of Head Start is. And there was a day, um, it was maybe a year or two ago. And our program in the nine years that I had been to, been, that I have been here had been through fiscal, legal, programmatic, active supervision, um, I mean, you name it, we'd been through it. We had climbed the hill of DRS with class scores and we had, we had won the grant back. We had been through so much. And I thought now's the time that, that, that we're going to get some calm in the storm. You think that was, you think that was what was coming for us? No, you're shaking your head. Cause you know, you know, what's coming. Uh, we had to do a self-reported disciplinary report for inappropriate discipline. You know what this is? Not if you know what this is. 
So if you have a staff person who, who um, has an issue with appropriate discipline, you have to self-report it. So we had done everything correctly. We had called all the right authorities. It was not child abuse. We did the right reporting in the right amount of time. I sent it in. I thought I was gonna get the email back that said, thank you very kindly. You did everything right. You're so good at your job and you don't have lipstick on your teeth because I just wanna know that at all times. So I thought, well, let's say that at the same time. But what I got was a email from my brand new program specialist, Anne, brand new. And she said, so you got the email? Can we talk? Well, I hadn't got the email because I was reading from the top down. So luckily I was ready for what was coming and it was a non-compliance for, for um, this inappropriate discipline. But the part that was the hardest for me is that in the non-compliance letter, it said that the, because it, I don't, if you haven't been through this, you get a lot of emails that ask you a lot of questions and you email your response back and then they ask you more questions and then you email your responses back. So when we finally got the non-compliance, it, it, it said that it was a non-compliance because of something I had said, because the executive director said it was inappropriate. So imagine, You've tried all these years to do the right thing. You have, you have been fastidious about performance standards, policies, procedures, fiscal, allowable costs. And then the letter says it was your fault. It was your fault. So we set up a call for the next day and, the, and, and it's a video call. And I think, I, I, I don't wear red lipstick that day, I assure you. Because I think I was like holding my, I think I was like this. And so I meet Anne while I'm holding up my head. And she says, how are you? And, and the next question I asked her was, what is your tolerance for the truth? Like, are you looking for me to say I'm okay? Or do you really want to know how I am? And she said, I really want to know. I really want to know how you are. And I said, there's no win for me. I've been doing this for eight years. There's no win for me. I've done everything. I've tried harder. I've tried to back off. I've tried to go left. I've tried to go right. I've tried to be encouraging. I've tried to be empowering. I've done all of these things. And here we are again with the non-compliance. And this time it's my fault. There is no win for me. And to her credit, um, Anne said, you're right. There is no win, but you know how to do this. And I thought, I do know how to do this. I know how to do, I know how to do a non-compliance. And so we went to work. What was interesting about that time is I had already been burned out for like three years. I'm just curious and I, you don't have to nod. Do you know what being burned out feels like? Like you are just done. You, you want to come to work the next day, but you don't know how to get in your car and drive to that place. You wanna be friendly with people. You want the coffee, but you're not willing to go down and get the coffee because you don't want somebody to ask you what's wrong because you don't wanna say what's wrong. And then you think tomorrow's gonna to be a better day. And then is tomorrow a better day? No. It's the same. So I was already so burned out that I had an opportunity to see things differently. And what I realized when I had that conversation with my brand new program specialist, Anne, is what if this was a game? And if I already know that I can't win, what if that changed the way that I played the game? So over the course of that next year, I kind of came up with some new rules because I had played the game before. I had played the game the way I thought Head Start wanted me to play the game. I was always available. I was always on. I always had the answer. I never rested until I had the answer for somebody else, but it wasn't working for me. So I thought, I'm going to try my own rules. And again, these rules are my own. And by the end of it, I'm hoping that you're going to catch the vision to write your own new rules. So let's start with the one the first one that I realized was the game's unwinnable. 
So it's the first rule, but it's also the punchline because the game is unwinnable. So if you're always trying to win the game in an unwinnable game, how tired are you gonna get? You're gonna be tired all the time because you are going to be chasing something that is not even there. Second rule, if you know it's a game, then know that games are fun. So I want you to, I want you to get the chat ready and I want you to see if you can think of as many games as possible that do not have risk and that are not random. So think of a game that is not random and that does not have risk when you play it and write it in the chat. And if you can think of one, I'm gonna buy 10 versions of it and play them every day. No, nope, can't think of any. Now think of a game where you win every single time you play. Who plays Wordle? Who plays Wordle? Who plays Wordle at midnight plus one minute? Because I know people that do, and I'm still friends with these people. You play Wordle every day. What if you played Wordle every day and the first word you got it every time? You were like, mm, stray, typed it in, all green. Oh, Teresa lost today. Yep. Because sometimes you get to that fifth try and you're like, I don't know. What word is it? It would be boring and you'd stop playing. But do you want your work day to be a win every single day? Every single day, do you wanna win? Most of us do. Would it be boring if there was no risk or randomness to your day? Is it possible that the very thing that you're trying to avoid is the very thing that would allow you to go down to that coffee machine and have something to say when somebody said, what's going on, right? What's going on? I won at Wordle today. Do you know the people who post that they won Wordle on the second try on Facebook? You happy about those people? You're not happy about those people. You're like, you got on the second try? Don't post that, right? We're gonna tell the truth to each other today. So let's start now. So I wanna talk about the game of Monopoly. So the game of Monopoly has a lot of rules to it. I want you to be thinking, does everybody familiar with the game of Monopoly? If you played Monopoly as a child and you were not an only child, how many times did you win the game of Monopoly? Does anybody have a memory? And if you do have a memory, I want you to put it in the chat. Does anybody have a memory of winning the game of Monopoly? I have a memory. I'm the youngest of five children. So most of the time when the game of Monopoly was over, it was because one of the siblings tossed the table. Do you know this? It's over when somebody flips the, the or just moves all the hotels off and says, well, it's over. And it was always when somebody else was winning. That's how Monopoly ended in the, in the Newman household. And yeah, the cheater brother, absolutely. Cheater brother flips it off. And you never got the cool car. You always wanted the car, but you ended up with the dog. And you're like, I don't want the dog or the top hat. And your brother probably, are, Dina, you're probably, your brother probably got the, the car every time because that was the cool one. <laughs> Monopoly to war. Exactly. Exactly. So Monopoly had a lot of rules and it had a lot of rules that, and we're going to kind of refer to that a little bit today as we keep going. But Monopoly also had some unwritten rules. So the unwritten rule was the older sibling got the best, the best play piece. So that's an unwritten rule. Another unwritten rule is if the youngest sibling was winning, the older sister cleared the board with her forearm, unwritten rule. 
So we know how many written rules Head Start has. How many do you think they have? From zero to a million, million and one. We know what the rules are. What are the, un, the what I wanna talk about today is the unwritten rules. So I want you to think about your daily life at work. And I want you to think about what are some of the unwritten rules? And if you have a piece of paper and a pen, I want you to write them down. What are some of the unwritten rules in the culture that you work under? So an example would be, um, you always have to be available. Does anybody have that as an unwritten rule? Head Start is not just your job, it's your life. You have to have the answer to every question that comes to you. Open door policy, Martha, yes. Your door has to be open all the time. I had a very wise um, coach at the beginning of my career who very well may be on this call right now. And I said to her as a young, fresh-faced executive director in her 40s, I'm going to have an open door policy. And Kate very wisely said, you might want to rethink that. I want to rethink that. And I did rethink it very quickly. I did rethink that. What about um, you have to always be your best self? No matter what happens, you have to be your best self and you have to be on and hyper vigilant all the time, flexible to the point of where it hurts. And the older you get, the more it hurts, right? If you're not giving 110% and burning the candle on both ends, you're not working hard enough. Yes, man. Ooh, these are good. Time management. Whenever, whenever you're overwhelmed, somebody says, well, how are you managing your time? Well, I'm doing Wordle at midnight plus one, so I'm managing it just fine. Thank you kindly, right? Do your job and everybody else's too. These are the unwritten rules. And what I'm going to say in this session today, these rules in the chat, this is what's burning you out. It's not the written rules of Head Start. Head Start is doable. It's pretty black and white. It's the unwritten rules that are going to burn you out. And so I want you to keep, I, I, I want you to keep the, the idea of the unwritten rules and have a few, keep them in the chat and then have a few because we're gonna, we're gonna circle back to those. Rule number three, the game goes slowly when you argue the rules. But this is what's interesting. You don't argue the rules when you're winning. If you're winning Monopoly, are you gonna flip the board? No, you're gonna take a picture of it. You only argue the rules and you only flip the board when you're losing. So if you argue the rules, it slows the game down for you, but it slows the game down for who else? Everybody else that you're playing with. To play the game, you have to keep playing. So in Monopoly, when you, when you uh, pull the card that says go directly to jail, how do you get out of jail? Do you get out of jail by saying, I'm not playing anymore? Or do you get out of jail by playing your next turn? You keep playing. The worst thing you can do when you're in jail is to stop playing. So if I go into DRS for class, is that when I quit and go somewhere else? It wasn't for me because I didn't wanna quit while I was in jail. I wanted to quit on the other side. My, my um, sister had been trying to, to make a decision to move from one town to the next town. And I was home last year and she was telling me the story about, about all of the worries that she had from moving from Brighton to Kingston. These are the two towns. And so she was thinking about uh, what about where she was going to live and where she was going to work and, and where she was going to go take yoga classes and all these different things. And she, she didn't make the decision to move for a long time, like a couple of years. 
And she told me that the defining moment when she made the decision was she was having a conversation with my brother, Jeff. And she said, what if this doesn't work out? What if this doesn't work out? What if this doesn't? And he said very calmly, well, then you do the next thing. So she's telling me this as we're driving in a car. And I wanted her to pull over because I'm like, say more about this. How many of us stay on the one thing until we make sure it works or don't go to the next thing until we make sure that thing's going to work? So this idea of try it and go to the next thing, that kind of sounds fun, doesn't it? And it's a little risky and it's a little random, but do the next thing. Are you going to get burned out doing the next thing? I will tell you that the number one message that burnout gave me was you're wearing a carpet in the rug, stop pacing. It was never that I was burned out by going to the next thing. It was always that I was doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And it was the thing that wasn't working. Being available 24 seven, is never gonna work, but you're gonna try it over and over and over and over and over. And burnout is your life saying, uh, friend, stop, stop pacing. Going to the next thing is gonna energize you. It's not gonna deplete you. Rule number four, your opponents aren't who you think they are. So when you're sitting playing Monopoly and you have a table full of people, you think that the people around the table is really who you're playing against. But what I learned was I was actually playing against myself. You have, you have voices in your head that give you feedback. Do you know this voice? I was, I was casting other people as the worst parts of myself and then getting upset for what they did. And I, and I realized when I heard the quote, and I wish I knew who wrote it, instead of listening to the voices in your head, talk to them. And once I realized that that those voices in my head were actually trying to protect me, manage things better for me. I watched a Taylor Swift documentary. Yes, I love Taylor Swift and uh, Miss Americana. Is anybody else gonna admit they love Taylor Swift? Let's get some nods out there. Yeah, yeah, cause she's fierce and she's fabulous and we love her. Um, and if we were together at a conference and if I ever see you at a conference and we're at the bar, we're going to ask them to play Shake It Off and then we're going to dance together because that's how good Taylor Swift is. So she did a documentary and she talked about when she had an eating disorder and she would see a picture of herself with maybe a little rounded stomach and she would stop eating. And in the documentary, when she realized what she was doing and she would see a picture of herself she would put her hand on her heart and, and pat her heart and say, we're not going to do that anymore. So she would talk to the voice in her head before it could talk to her. A couple of years ago, when, when our pre-service was still in person, I spoke for like four hours. And if you ever want to know what the voice in your head says, do a little public speaking, because that girl will show up and quick. She won't even wait for you to get to your car. There's going to be some girls in there or guys saying what you didn't do right. Do you, you know what I'm talking about? So as I get in the car and I leave orientation and I've talked for way too long, I tried this. And as I'm driving home, I say, I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do. And I know why you're going to do it. And I don't need you to do that. I did my best. I did my best. So if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, I'm just gonna stop talking for 30 seconds. And I want you to write down the first thing that that voice says to you when you do anything risky or anything random, or you try anything new, what does that voice say to you? What's the first thing he or she says? And I'm just gonna stop talking for 30 seconds.
and I want you to write it down. Yeah, that is the mean girl talking, Leslie, you're right. So keep that, we're gonna keep that, we're gonna come back to that later. Once I realized what that voice was trying to do, the first thing I needed to say to her was, I'm sorry. And the second was, thank you. Because I didn't understand. I was constantly trying to get that voice to stop talking. But that's not what she was trying to say. She was trying to protect me. And so if I would turn and give that voice some attention, it was a very different outcome. And we're going to talk more about that little voice a little bit later. Rule number five, allow other people to play their hand. If you're playing Monopoly at a table, play your own hand and don't play anybody else's turn. If you play somebody else's hand, the only thing that they have left to play is you. If you take over and you tell them what to do and when to do it, and they can't directly play their hand in their life, then they will turn and play you. And what does that look like? What does that look like when somebody plays you? Does it look like manipulation, guilt? Passive aggressive, it feels horrible, you're right, you're right. Do you see that if that when you do not allow somebody to play that game directly, that is their only other option. If you're gonna play their hand, then they are going to play you. When somebody comes and asks you about their hand, this is really interesting because we love to give advice. Don't we love to get advice? It's not our favorite thing ever. When somebody asks you what to do when it's their turn, the really interesting thing here is you can't give them advice on the hand they're playing because you're not playing it. So you end up giving them advice on the hand that you've played. But here's what's the kicker. You're giving them advice on the hands you've played in the past, and they're asking you for advice on the hand they're playing in the present. So are you gonna give them good advice? You can't, you can't give somebody good advice. The interesting thing about us is that we think that we can overcome years and years and years and years of somebody else's conditioning. We're gonna tell them what to do and we think they're gonna do it. We think we can overcome that kind of conditioning from parents and siblings and spouses and teachers and self-concept and beliefs. And we think if we say, play it this way, they're gonna be like, Roger that. But guess what? Can you overcome your own conditioning? How many of you want to do something in your life and you don't do it? How many of you want to work out or go to yoga and you don't do it because you're not overcoming your own beliefs and conditioning, but we think we can overcome somebody else's? That's really interesting. And um, does that make you tired? Do you think it makes you tired to play somebody else's hand and to be giving them advice that doesn't work? So what do you do instead? What do you do instead? You ask them about their hand. When they ask you what to do, you ask them about their hand. You don't tell them about yours. I had a, a, um, an experience several years ago when my second child who was a boy wanted to join the army right out of high school. And he wanted to join the army when I said, what about the Air Force? Because my dad was an Air Force pilot. No. And he wanted to join the army. And I said, what about if you were like someone in the back of the, you know, like back at the base camp, like you could be something that you could be like an IT guy or, and he was like, no, infantry. Really want to do infantry. So you don't want to just do the army. You want to do infantry. Okay. And he wanted to do it right out of high school. So we were planning a trip to Canada. That's where I'm from. 
We were planning a trip to Canada. He wanted to join in June. We were going to Canada in July. And I spent a lot of time trying to play this kid's hand. What if you joined in August? And what if you didn't join the army? What if you surprised everybody and joined the Air Force and were safe forever and ever? And also, if you never left your room and were in bubble wrap, that would be something that I would agree to. Let's try that. So I'm, I'm haranguing him. What about, what about August? What about September? And one day we were in the kitchen and he turned and he just said, stop. I'm not a chapter in your book anymore. I want to write my own book. And all of a sudden I understood. He didn't want me to write his story. And he didn't want it to be a piece of my book. He wanted his own book. And he didn't want me to edit it. He didn't want me to pull out a red pencil and say, what about this and try this? He wanted me to read it. And he wanted me to ask questions about it. What happens in the next chapter? Then what are you gonna do? He wanted me to be excited about it. That is what I learned when he came back from being in the army he wanted to be a coal miner. So I was like, your book is really exciting and I need to not think about it a lot because he also loves to go um, target shooting with guns. And so one, two, three, this Canadian mother is not okay. So I love that he has his different book and I was able to close the chapter in my book about who I thought he was. Because the interesting thing about life is we expect each other to be the last version that we knew of you. So if I haven't seen you in a couple of years, you still want me to be the way I was two years ago. And the greatest gift you can give anybody is to learn who they are over and over and over and over again. And when Jacob was a chapter in my book, he was the way I wrote him. Well, that's not who he is anymore, is it? When you meet somebody in your life, the best thing you can do is ask them the questions that you assume you know the answers to because you don't know who they are anymore. I'm going to say when you ask questions, there's two things that I learned. One is listen longer than you think that you need to because the first part of what anybody tells you is what they think you want to hear. If you listen long enough, the second part is what they might need to say. So we're gonna to go to rule number six. It isn't about my turn. It's about the next turn. It isn't about just the way that I play the game. It's about the game. It's not just about the way I interact with life. It's about life. When I was turning 50, my sister Tracy asked me what I wanted to do for my 50th. Did I wanna go on a trip? Did I wanna go on a cruise? Um, no. I get seasick. What did I want to do? And out of a place in me that I didn't even know was there, I said, I want to go back to every place I ever lived. And I want to pick up the person, the piece of the person that I left there. Because that person that I told you before you were a teenager, before you were a wife and a mother, I wanted to remember her. And I wanted at the age of 50 to be whole. I wanted to bring all those parts of me back and I wanted to be whole. And so I did, I went to seven places. I went back to Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, where I was born. And I went to Trenton and I went to, to Prince Edward Island where I had lived with my mother. And then I went to Idaho and I went to Utah. And what I took a rock from where I live right now and I would leave a rock and I would pick up something from where I was. And every time that I would leave one of these places, a word would come to me, love, belonging, tenacity, trust. And after a while, I thought, I'm not going back to see what I left there. I'm going back to realize what I took from there. That as you become the newest versions of yourself, you layer word upon word upon word about who you are and what you are now. And that was what whole meant to me. And all of a sudden I realized what I was searching for was to be whole, which wasn't the same as being good. It wasn't the same as being perfect. Whole didn't mean 
good. And it didn't mean perfect. And it didn't mean worthy. It wasn't wholeness. It was the whole of us. So it was everybody around the table. I had spent my whole 50 years of life trying to leave the table or get somebody to leave the table or not invite somebody to the table. And I realized that's not what the answer was at all. It was that you bring everybody to the table, those who fill your heart with love, those who break your heart, those who leave upset with you, those who leave cherishing you, that all of that is the wholeness of life. The parts of you that are available and the parts of you that are not available, the parts of you that are loving and the parts of you that are not so loving. That's what wholeness was. The end of the game is that you're not worthy of winning. You're just worthy. That's what wholeness is. Rule number seven, look up from the game. You can know that life is a game and you can keep playing it. And once in a while you can look up and you can see who's playing the game with you. You can see who's surrounding you. In your life, you have this beautiful thread that runs through your entire life. And it's beautiful and light and it's all yours. But the trouble is, I think that we think that that thread is just filled with our winning moments. The times we were lovely and kind and gracious and beautiful. The times that we were available 24 seven, the times that we had the answer, the times that we, were, that we were playing all the rules and we were doing everything right. But as I, as I continued on in this journey, I realized that that thread is intertwined with pain and heartache and loss. And that that's what makes it beautiful. That there are beautiful threads and painful threads and they're twisted together. And it's all yours and it belongs to you. I want to just suggest that in your daily life, the most painful things that you're dealing with also can be beautiful. That there are things in, there are rules that you are living that we can dare to change. And one of the things that I want to suggest is that there are people walking with you where you're going. And sometimes burnout means that you are alone instead of with the people that are surrounding you. Uh, Ram Das has a quote that says, we are all just walking each other home. I have this story I love to tell about my childhood when I ran away. How many of you ran away as kids? Did you pack a bag? Was the bag filled with stuffed animals? Yes or no? Because it was. Maybe licorice? Yes, Nicole says yes, her bag was filled with them. So I was probably six, seven, eight years old and we lived at a farm that had a long quarter mile laneway and I packed a little hard case suitcase with all my stuffed animals and I was gonna run away. And the whole intention was everybody was gonna be so upset that by the time I came back and announced my arrival, everybody was gonna be so relieved. Does this sound familiar? Everybody was going to be so relieved. And books, yes, the books made it really heavy, but you had to have some books to read to the stuffed animals. I get it, Suzette, I get it. So I take, I, I tell the story all the time because the punchline of the story is I walked to the end of the laneway. I waited there a while. I thought, man, there is search parties. I think there's going to be a helicopter soon. Really excited when the SWAT team comes in because uh, I, I wanted to be on the news. I didn't know how I was going to get on the news. This is how I'm going to get on the news. I'm really excited about it. And I walked up, my mother was reading a book and I walked up to my mother and I said, rest easy, I'm home. And without even looking up from the book, she says, I didn't even know you were gone. So I took my suitcase back to my room. You unpack the books, 
you unpack the stuffed animals. Six or seven years ago at my dad's house, he's coming to the end of his life. He was 83 years old and he asked for one thing. He wanted his five kids to come to his house for the weekend, no siblings, no kids. And he wanted us to be his kids again. He wanted us to play games. He wanted us to order in food, have a couple of drinks. And he wanted to watch us. We spent the weekend there together. It's the greatest gift my dad gave any of us. And that story comes up. And I tell that funny story with the punchline that I love that my mother didn't know I was gone. And he says, oh man, the look on your face when you got to the end of the driveway. And I said, how do you know what I look like at the end of the driveway? And he said, oh, cause I followed you and I hid behind every tree. And he waited to make sure that I turned back home and I got there safely. And I didn't know. There are people walking you home every day and you're never going to know unless you look up from that game and see them. So I want to take a minute and I want you to go back to where you wrote down what that voice in your head says. And I want you to write something down back to it. I want you to write down Appreciation, understanding, grace. And rewrite what you've always believed. And the one thing I want to suggest is when you talk to people, when you are burned out, set your intention to speak from that second sentence, not the first sentence. Because I bet if you look at that first sentence, you've said that to people, haven't you? The way that that voice talks to you in your head is how you've talked to other people when you are not at your best. And if we bring grace and understanding and love, you can interact with people from that second voice. So we have a couple of minutes to go back to those unwritten rules. I'm gonna ask you a question. Do you have to be available all the time? No. Can you take your work phone and bless it at 5 p.m. and shut it off and open it the next day? Can you shut your door? Can you lock it? And then when someone knocks, can you sit on your hands and don't go open it? You only have to live a new rule once, you know, till somebody starts to believe that you mean it. So if you rewrite the rules that are burning you out and making you tired, what would that look like for you? So I'm gonna talk about a couple. There is a difference between being nice and being kind. So one of the rules that we have is that we need to be nice. But nice is an agreement that you're asking somebody else to believe that you were nice to them. Kind is one way. Nice is I have to have my door open because if you come in and my door's closed, that means I wasn't being nice to you. Being kind means, well, I put a sign on my door so I kindly let you know I was not available. It doesn't need agreement from the other person. Nice means I'm going to tell the truth, but I need you to agree with me. Kind is I'm going to tell the truth kindly. That can be a new rule. Second rule, boundaries. We talk about boundaries a lot, right? We think that a boundary is what? What do you think a boundary is? 
can drop it in the chat. What do you think a boundary is? A barrier, what else? A wall, yep. Stake in the sand, protection, limit. Ooh, these are great words, limits. A line not to cross, self-care, yep. So boundaries, we always work on setting boundaries and, and are we successful? If somebody is 100% successful with their boundary game, I'm gonna need you to find me at the next conference. We're gonna have lunch together and you're gonna tell me how you do it. This is what I learned about boundaries. Boundaries are about telling the truth. But here's the kicker. We wanna set a boundary by telling the truth and then making sure that the other person still likes us. That's not a boundary, that's manipulation. Does manipulation make you tired? It sure does. A boundary is telling the truth, period. And allowing the other person to then deal the hand that that truth dealt them. But here's the thing about telling the truth in a boundary. Don't you tell the truth about somebody else because you don't know. You only can tell the truth about yourself. When you tell the truth about how somebody else is, is that true? Or is that playing their hand? It's playing their hand, exactly. So we have a couple of more minutes. I'm gonna tell the end of the story of the non-compliance. Do you wanna know what happened? You wanna know what happened? So when you do the non-compliance, you send in a, a, um, an infinite number of documents to prove that you corrected the action. And then you have a Zoom call with somebody from Danya, the federal reviewer. You have your program specialist. You have a board chair, policy council member. You have some management team, the executive directors on there. And you get interviewed and you explain um, all of your documents. And we had a two hour call with all those players. It was one of the most beautifully poignant two hours of my career. The teachers talked about how, how um, the classroom changed, how we created a safe space for teachers to go to when they were overwhelmed, a safe word, how we created beautiful spaces for them to feel appreciated and loved, how we did resilience training, all the things that we had served them and they were able to speak to it. And we were able to talk about the changes that we had made and the intentions that we had. And at the end of the two hours, I got an email from Anne, the brand new program specialist and had one sentence. And it said, you must be so proud. And I was proud and I was scared and I was joyful and I was anxious. And in that moment, we were whole. So at the end, the interesting thing is, it isn't about playing Monopoly, is it? You're playing the game of life. And if it's unwinnable, why don't you play it anyways and have fun and rewrite those rules that are making you tired and create a life where you're gonna do the next thing and it's gonna energize you and move you forward. Head Start is built on tenacity. It's built on change. It's built on energy. It's built on service. It's built on, on also fun and laughing and togetherness and community. And everybody on this call today is whole. I thank you for your time. I have so many more things to say, but I have one more minute to just say thank you. Thank you. That was great. I so appreciate that. I wish we were in a room where we could stand up and applaud. Um, <laughs> I want to add, and, and that was real. I felt the energy. This was great. I wasn't sure on Zoom, Carrie, how this would, would come across. I think it was fantastic. I want to add a layer on top of everything she just said, because I'm sure you're a little overwhelmed. There were a lot of rules in there for 
an hour and your brain might be trying to process what if that made sense to me? What can I apply? Whatever it is, it's great. We talk about this in the director credential a lot about leadership. And here's the thing that matters so much here. You're going to take whatever nuggets away from this that resonated with you. And maybe you'll shift, maybe you'll shut your door. Maybe you'll leave your phone away when you go home at night and you'll be really scared when you first do that. Your palms will sweat and you'll wonder what in the world's coming across your phone. But trust me, the sun will rise and you'll get up and deal with it. The most important thing you're going to do when you do that, well, maybe the most important thing is you're going to take care of yourself. But in my leadership perspective, the best thing you do is set an example for all of those people who work for you because they're going to look to you to see how do I, how can I be successful? And if the answer to that, I work until I'm exhausted and crying, then that's what they'll do. And your staff will be in the same burnout state that you're in. The more you can show them healthy leadership and healthy living, the more they will replicate that for themselves. And your overall work and your program and your staff will be stronger for it. And it'll be more fun. That's the best part. Life should just be more fun. I, I just love this message. Um, I, I think putting yourself first and taking care of yourself and figuring out all those things is a big part of leadership. Um, and I hope that you were able to take a few things back with you from this. Um, as I said in the beginning, this is this, the first of, of a series that we're doing through about August here at NHSA. Our next one is in two weeks. We will have the wonderful Paula Margraf from Allentown, Pennsylvania. She retired this year um, and has an incredible history of establishing partnerships in her community in Allentown. And she's gonna come talk to you about how she did that um, and what it meant for her children, for her staff, and for the families in the community in Allentown. And it's just with some really, really good stuff. So if you can make our next um, leadership uh, webinar, please do pass the word to your friends who are in leadership so that everybody can get re-energized for the new year. You, I always make sure that I put my email in the chat. I am always available if anybody ever has a question about NHSA, about what we're doing at the Academy or with these webinars and effective practice, please email me. Or if you have a suggestion, um, I'm really struggling with this. Is there any way you can put something together in this area? We are always listening. We want, we're here for you. So the best we can do is listen to you. Um, and if you're interested, I mean, I'm sure you're getting your pre-service all nailed down and, and, and organized. If you need any support with that, you can check out the Academy at NHSA. We have some really great pre-service. I think Carrie, you all did the Head Start Basics last year, I think. Um, some of that stuff that you can do asynchronously, make your pre-service a little easier. We try to make it really affordable for you and accessible. And if that's helpful to you, wonderful. Hope to see you all in a couple of weeks. And between now and then, it is still July. Hope you get outside, enjoy some sunshine, take a walk, climb a mountain, do whatever it is you do in the summer to make yourself feel great. Have a great day, everybody.